take this of the area.
difference between the protected areas and how much they contribute to an ecosystem service, here looking at, at the carbon map, there's only the one up there in the middle that provides a lot of this service. But if you go and look down south in the savanna, it's not that, uh, that important, that specific ecosystem service. Timber, this was nice to see that indeed the, uh, the concessions are nicely uh, located <coughs> outside the protected areas, meaning that the two ministries are actually talking to each other. So this, this is good news. Um, fuel woods, the same thing. It's about accessibility mainly for fuel wood. And most of the protected areas are just too isolated to go to. So there is not a strong fuel wood production going on, except again in that uh, in the protected area all in the east. Tourism is one-to-one -one related to the protected areas. So yes, this is, this is the assumption we made, so we can see tourism in protected areas. And habitat, the same, there's not a direct use, but you can see that not all protected areas are located um, have very unique habitats. Actually, that one, that, that, that big protected area that is providing a lot of carbon is not that unique and is not in the Congo. This kind of, uh, yeah, so this gives an idea about ecosystem services. Um, are they actually being provided in the different uh, protected areas? And it gives us an idea, if we start using the ecosystem services, where we can find those potential conflicts. Because uh, the objective of a protect protected area is different than a <coughs> use objective. To wrap this all a bit up, this methodological framework that I presented with the four blocks, it's, it's, it's kind of a nice way to help us to understand where, is eco where the ecosystem services are being supplied, what are the key indicators, what is important for land use, management, what is not. Um, we can also, if we apply this to the, to the protected areas, we could support maybe uh, the management plans of the protected areas because we now can nicely <coughs> identify where ecosystem services are being supplied, therefore may also wanting to be used, but, it's, but it might, be, might lead to a conflict. And also by making this very basic linkage to the beneficiaries, we also get an idea who and which groups of beneficiaries are going to be affected in a positive or in a negative way. Um, something that quite some of you might already have been thinking of, this, this methodology misses socio-economic aspects. I'm, if I'm talking about beneficiaries, I'm only talking about the people that get the goods and services but if I talk about tourism, there are so many more people that sell the tickets that, or, or for timber. There's, there's a whole market chain. So the benefits are not only going to the end user, but there's a lot of other actors actually involved in this chain. This is not being taken into account. And also the, uh, the global market. If it's not coming from Congo, we get our timber from somewhere else. This is not, this is not yet or not uh, covered in this... Um, this methodology. And also something that most of the, the biophysical mapping people will know, it's you're using a huge simplification, you're identifying your main your main um, spatial indicators and that is that leads to an ecosystem service map. But of course there's a lot of um, it's it's easy, it's it's nicely to implement even for a big huge country in Africa like I've showed you. It's a it's, but then you introduce uncertainty that we have to be clever enough to communi communicate this well enough and take this into account if we're going to say anything about management plans or if we're going to say anything about the understanding of the system. That's my story for today. I thank you for your attention and yeah.